just love to hear from you and, and for the audience, um, you know, how you find yourself here. Um, you wear many hats. <laughs> you're a writer, you're a journalist, um, you, you curate and direct this platform, AfricanFeminism.com. Um, you do social work, you do, you know, you, you do so many things. And so can you talk to us a little bit about how you find yourself in this Probably. path? In both. In, no, in this path of the work, in this path of yeah. the work that you're doing. No, thank you so much. Uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, to hear from you and engage really on, uh, on uh, African feminism. Um, I'm a journalist, like you said, I'm a trained journalist, but um, I've done a lot of work with women's organizing, social movements, and uh, both documenting them, but also helping some of them with strategies on how to actually communicate uh, change and push for social change in Uganda. Uh, and currently I, I create an editor platform called African Feminism, uh, where I work with uh, 25 writers from different African countries. We're trying to document stories of women, um, African women, uh, both their struggles, but just all around the experiences of African women, um, their achievements, and uh, just everyday conversations that we need to, to bring out um, and document, because often when you read stories about African women, um, it's a story of victimhood, you know, it's it, it, the idea, uh, the image, uh, both global media projected and also in terms of colonial histories. When we talk about feminist movements, we're often talking about feminism um, through a predominantly Western perspective, as, as Western feminists then bring feminism to the African continent, when in fact feminism has really been embedded in the fabric of, of women in Africa for centuries, right? And if we're speaking more recently, kind of in, in the kind of anti-colonial movement, and then, and then looking at kind of more contemporary examples, of course, um, the uprisings that are happening in Sudan right now, you see the ways in which women are really at the forefront of the uprising. Yeah. So I guess I would love for you to speak a little bit more about that and maybe how this platform that you're directing, um, AfricanFeminism.com, fe um, how does it speak to these various experiences across, across the continent, okay. kind of more specifically? Yeah, I think uh, looking at history is very important. It's it's uh, the kind of conversation is two way. People coming from the West saying like this is what you should do. This is what feminism, your feminism should concern uh, about. But also seeing like in uh, African countries, people thinking feminism is something imported from the West. And yet, you know, you're from Egypt. Women like Nawal uh, um, Sadawi, uh, she's one of the earliest feminists. She's Egyptian. And if you think, if you don't read then you don't know that she was the most vocal uh, feminist. She, she went to jail. She was exiled most of the time uh, when um, Osama Mubarak was a leader. She was living in exile because she was vocal. And uh, she was uh, the first, she, she, I think, published one of the first earliest feminist uh, literature uh, coming out of Egypt and inspiring a uh, whole of African feminists from Egypt uh, to, to Ghana. Uh, when you look at the colonial <coughs> movement, and this is like in the early 30s, it's, uh, that's what we are talking about. So um, this is not, she was not being told by anybody. Uh, she was resisting both uh, the colonial and also the patriarchal states that she was living in. Um, so when you, you see such women, it's very important to actually bring their stories and they be known. Um, also, women like uh, uh, Femi Kuti, uh, uh, who is the People might know her because of her son, Fela Kuti, but actually mm -hmm. uh, his mother was feminist. She was one of the first women in Nigeria to drive a car, and she was at the forefront of the, of the, of the anti-colonial movement and organizing women in unions, and, and all these women were there. But uh, um, when you came to Tanzania, women like Bibi Titi Muhammad, they were organizing the women wing of the Tanzania, Tanganyika African um, uh, the, the struggle. And this women um, have been around. Those are the stories of the women, uh, of different women in Africa who delivered the nations and delivered uh, against re different resistances. I think, I mean, how would you then describe the state of African feminism, especially amongst young feminists today? 
uh, I would say like they are different African feminisms, mm -hmm. but uh, they are fundamentals. Uh, for example, in uh, 2006, um, a group of African feminists met and uh, drew the charter of principles for African feminists. And it's one of the document that actually informs our organizing a lot. Uh, a lot of women, uh, we must recognize that African feminism is not just a practice we have some of the best scholars in the world on feminism being African. Uh, Mina Mama, uh, sleep Professor Slavia Tamale, who's Ugandan, who has documented histories of African sexuality, you know, trying to, to, to show um, African beliefs and different norms that were actually more tolerant uh, sometimes and how they have been affected through the process of colonization and now the, the recent struggles to actually uh, kind of decolonize uh, uh, this, this struggle, uh, these issues. Um, so we have those women and they have done the good job of uh, not just giving us the tools and the names through which to call what we know as African feminism, because they are able to give us the labels to do the theory, the hard work. Uh, it's one thing to experience something. It is another for somebody to tell you what you're experiencing can be defined like this. And it's important that African women are the, at the forefront of defining their own experiences. And those women are there, and they are theorizing every day. Uh, you have uh, uh, women like Dr. Stella Nyanzi from Uganda also, who's currently in jail for um, for really pushing against the current government, which is uh, the president has been in power for 33 years, so we have we are seeing uh, African women at that, and they're not being told by someone from the outside that you should do this. We have always had the struggle uh, with the pre-colonial times. You have so many uh, stories about women resisting. It's not something that we were taught. I don't think that someone oppressing you can teach you how to resist. Now women are using kind of an online space as this other space to kind of confront those issues, to express those issues, but then they're experiencing um, different kinds of dangers. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you feel like the online space then is a, is it a game changer? I mean, or is, is there something that can be gleaned from that? Uh, that's a great question. I think that online spaces and many times, they kind of replicate what is in reality. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, ca you could create something online, but actually a lot of hierarchies that happen outside the online world are transplanted to online in many times, uh, which also includes uh, violence against women. There's a lot of um, the connectedness of uh, violence against women and gender-based violence coming out because of the dictator world we live in uh, and, the, and the new ways of oppressing a woman because we live in a dictator world um, are expanding. Um, that said, the online world has also given women a tool mm -hmm. to, to be able to organize and mobilize. And when we are working at African Feminism, actually, most of the writers I've never met in person. Mm -hmm. I have known their work through because reading and people recommending, and I follow that work. Uh, for example, during the, um, the revolution in, in Sudan, uh, we, we contacted different women who were actually documenting the, the, the story of women and pushing different campaigns and that we can use dictator tools differently to actually contribute to the, to, to, to the social change we are, we are taking part in. So definitely women are using that mobilization. Uh, in Uganda, uh, we've seen uh, last year we organized the Uganda Women's March because there was a spike uh, in femicide cases, and not just like um, abduction and uh, rape of women. Uh, in the one year we had, I think, like 40 women uh, targeted. So women organized uh, um, a march, and most of the women who were who came to the march knew each other from online. They had never met anywhere. So the power of actually merging these both worlds and, and the need to actually merge those worlds. And in a, in a country like Uganda, where we don't have freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, protesting, it was the first time we actually pushed in like 10 years to allow a procession that is about an issue to in in most of the of the of the people that came to the march were like feminists who were intersectional and looking at different issues. Uh, but but the power that we knew each other mostly from online world and we had never met some of them and we came and put up a protest. Uh, we've seen the same moves in Kenya. Uh, Kenyan women organized. Uh, it's called the Toto Shadow. 
the own Kenya in March and also also kind of pushing back <coughs> against uh, uh, femicide. And mm -hmm. right now, South African mm -hmm. women are actually mobilizing under the, the hashtag Am I Next, but also coming to different government buildings and protesting. Um, so the, the, the internet being a tool mm -hmm. that can amplify and offer opportunities to women, new connections, mm -hmm. new opportunities for organizing and accessing rights mm -hmm. uh, is real. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, your your platform African African feminism. I mean, do you think that that somehow then becomes this kind of platform to mobilize? And and to who does it? Who to who does it speak to? I think it's largely young African feminists, mm -hmm. and mobilization is just part of it. Like uh, for us, it's about leading conversations mm -hmm. and amplifying conversations that women are having, uh, because there's a lot of people organizing. Like you have to know what your niche is. I think it, this is more about amplifying what is identifying what is the kind of uh, what are South African women dealing with, what are Nigerian women dealing with, how do we then bring this story out so that other women in the continent can understand and see themselves maybe in that struggle but also understand how to how to support. Um, for, for us that's the space but also we operate in a, in a, a vacuum where there's really lack of a pan-African media. Mm -hmm. A lot of what Africans depend on understanding another country is through uh, a Western media, CNN, BBC, mm -hmm. everything filtered you know mm -hmm. so we are trying to see that space uh, to increase the connectedness and people understanding voices unfiltered much from uh, other African countries and and the need to have those spaces is very important investment in the media because we we come we come to this space where there's been long held and long developed produced narratives about the continent that actually people in another part of the continent believe these things about another another country. The need to break those stereotypes is not about the Western world also uh, dealing with that, but actually even within Africa for people to understand uh, mm -hmm. um, themselves better because uh, the m major way they have been consuming knowledge is through the Western, you know, mm -hmm. uh, bouncing information uh, via <laughs> Europe or America. So the need for more connected uh, African uh, media, independent media projects is very is very important. So for us, we're trying to, to, to really look at that space and knowledge production and knowledge sharing.